Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Solutions Beyond Water. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Eppendorf. Eppendorf is a leading life science company that develops and sells instruments, consumables, and services for liquid sample and cell handling in laboratories worldwide. For more information, please visit eppendorf.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window, or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Hane A. Hinka and Dr. Rudolf Volchek. Dr. Henke is a field application specialist focusing on liquid handling specialized in positive displacement dispenser and pipettes at Eppendorf headquarters in Hamburg, Germany. She joined Eppendorf in 2015 after finishing her PhD in medical microbiology on the topic of Staphylococcus epidermidis tip joint infections at the University Hospital in Hamburg. In vitro microphage studies were part of her PhD research. Hane focused on molecular biology and genetics early during her studies of biology at the University of Hamburg and deepened her knowledge in food microbiology laboratories and at Harvard Medical School in the group of Professor Roberto Coulter. A project management course in cooperation with Johnson & Johnson Medical in Germany extended Dr. Henke's skills in establishing trainings and giving seminars. A musical education prior to her studies in biology brought her presentation skills to perfection. Dr. Wolczyk's role is as the global product manager in the areas of cell handling and liquid handling at Eppendorf AG. He is located in Hamburg, Germany. He studied biochemistry at the University of Tübingen and at the Rockefeller University in New York. Rudolf's PhD work at Emil Heidelberg was to investigate the mechanisms of post-mitotic nuclear pore complex formation using protein biochemistry, molecular biology, and cell biology methods. Prior to joining Eppendorf, he worked as a consultant for BCG, focusing on projects in the healthcare industry. I will now turn it over to Rudolf and Hane to start the presentation. So thank you, Judy, um, for your kind introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Solutions Beyond Water, Successfully Pipetting Problematic Liquids. Um, my name is Rudolf Walczak, um, and together with my colleague Hanna E. Henke, I will guide you through the webinar. Um, at the end, of course, we will also have a Q&A session. So what are our objectives for today's webinar? Um, in the beginning, we want to provide you an overview of uh, the available different um, tools and instruments in working with liquids. And we want to highlight challenges that you might be facing when working with difficult or problematic liquids, such as volatile liquids like ethanol or viscous liquids like glycerol. We will introduce the different problematic liquid classes and at the same time, of course, present solutions, how to work with them and how to handle them successfully. And since we will be pointing out a number of benefits for a specific type of liquid handling instrument, namely dispensers. We also want to give you some brief additional information on the benefits that these dispensers have beyond problematic liquids. So these are the chapters for today. I will start with the introduction and then Hannah A. will take you through the different liquid challenges and liquid classes. So working in, in life science research, almost everyone is somehow handling liquids. I mean, this is no surprise. Of course, most of life's processes occur in an aqueous milieu, and um, consequently biochemists, molecular biologists, and also cell biologists work with aqueous solutions. And here in this tech cloud, we've listed some of the most typical applications um, that you could be using in your own research, 
and they all involve working with one kind or another uh, of liquid. And probably you will recognize two or three of these applications that you are also um, facing in your daily work and using. And each of these applications, of course, has different liquids. And depending on the properties that these liquids have, they also have different requirements, both in terms of how you handle them, but also in terms of the knowledge you, you need for working with them, and also in terms of the instruments and the tools that you, that you use. And we want to also shed some light on this. So usually, we don't think very thoroughly about the different aspects that one might consider when working with different liquids. But we want to give some brief introduction on this as well. So of course, the most important consideration is what kind of liquids do you actually work with? So whether you have a glycerol solution or, for example, um, sulfuric acid or a volatile solution, um, they can be very different the way you have to pipette them and work with them. But the kind of liquid is by far not the only consideration that you have to, have to make. Another one, of course, is what's your sample throughput? How much pipetting do you actually do? How many samples do you have? And how many pipetting steps do you do? And also, how complex is the, the liquid handling work that you do? Additional aspects to consider are, for example, in which volume range do you work? Um, typically, microliter, of course, in the life sciences. And also, other things like what is your source and what is your destination vessel, so from which bottle or vessel are you pipetting into what target vessel? And there are many other things to consider. And all this, um, depending on the individual application and workflow, determines the optimal choice of your liquid handling tool. And we want to highlight the first two categories or aspects a little more before going into the different liquid classes. So if you think about the kind of liquid that you work with, we've made a very simple gradient you see on the left side. There are some liquids which are rather simple in terms of the demands they, they make on the instrument and on the experimentator, and some are more demanding. And what do we mean by this? So this is very much correlated with the liquid, with the properties of the different liquids. Simple liquids are those that have a low viscosity, low vapor pressure. They do not contain detergents or very low concentrations of detergents. And um, they are basically salt solutions or simple aqueous solutions. More demanding liquids would be those with a higher density, high protein concentration, high viscosity, vapor pressure, or, for example, high detergent concentration. What are examples of these liquids? So, of course, most liquids in life science being, being used and being worked with are aqueous solutions. So simple solutions could be a saline solution um, and even a low detergent concentration containing solutions like 0.1% SDS or a Triton solution. If you go to a um, cell culture medium um, containing a fetal calf serum or to a high concentration protein solution, um, you can already get foam formation, and these are what we think are more demanding solutions. And of course, if you go to liquids like blood or high concentrations of glycerol and also PCR master mix, um, these become more demanding. And in addition, of course, you have non-aqueous solutions or organic solvents like acetone, ethanol, or mineral oil, and these are much more difficult in terms of how to handle them, how to pipette them. And the same is true for dense solutions like phosphoric acid and sulfuric acid. So this is our first aspect to consider. The other one is the throughput dimension. So the question, how many samples, how many pipetting steps do you actually have? And here we again have made a very simple axis from low throughput to high throughput, which you see at the bottom. And on the left side, it's, it's the regular, simple, standard pipetting and you, you work with individual tubes, you do single liquid transfers, whereas the further you move to the right side, the more you will be doing more tedious, um, fast, complex pipetting protocols, and you will also be working with vessels like plates, and you will have many samples. And if you put these two together, we get what we call the liquid handling matrix. So the different liquid handling tools, like different pipettes um, and also dispensers, are in different positions in this matrix, depending on the kind of liquid you work with and on the 
the sample throughput or the number of pipetting steps you do. And we briefly want to guide you through this. So the first and most well-known category of liquid handling tools are manual pipettes. These are the standard air cushion pipettes which are used by almost every life science researcher and um, they are mostly being used for routine pipetting tasks. They exist as single or multi-channel pipettes and something that you can do if you work with more demanding liquids, if you go further up along the y-axis, you can use special tips for special liquids and also special um, pipetting techniques and we will go into this in the second part. So special tips could be, for example, dual filter tips as in A, those you could use for warm or infectious liquids, both to avoid contamination but also corrosion of your pipette. And B is an example um, of a low retention tip, which basically can be used for foaming liquids such as deter detergent containing solutions. If we go to higher throughput, um, now we're moving to the right on the x-axis, you see that um, electronic pipettes uh, are the tool of choice. Um, you can more easily do higher throughput. They also exist um, as single or multi-channel pipettes. Um, of course, on the left side, you see the pipette controller, which is very typical for cell culture work. And also, of course, electronic pipettes can be used with different consumables, like special tips. And of course, you can similarly apply uh, special pipetting techniques. If you go to even higher throughput, then you start entering the realm of automated liquid handling, and this is for even higher throughput. For example, if you want to fill complete plates within one step, so this is the, the instrument on the left side, which is the EP Motion 96, and if you want to go to full automation, both of pipetting and also of incubating um, tasks, then you can go to, to use a pipetting robot, which you see on the right side, which is the EP Motion, for example. And all these different tools are actually in the, in the area of rather simple um, liquids. So if you go to very demanding liquids, then we actually recommend yet another tool. And um, so these are the handheld dispensers. Um, and those are good for both doing long dispensing series, if you want to distribute liquid, for example, within a plate. But also they are very good for handling problematic liquids. And um, this is the focus for today's presentation, not so much on these tools, but actually on the kind of work that you will be doing with them. So you see, this is just giving you an overview. These are the first things to consider, and there are many different choices for the right liquid handling tool. And the important thing here is, if you put some thought into what is the best tool for your work, of course, working with liquids will be easier for you, it will be safer, and of course, also, you will have um, more safety in terms of the quality of the results that you, that you get in the end. So throughout this webinar, we will have um, a number of different poll questions, and we would kindly ask you to, to answer these questions. So this is our first question, and um, the question is, which liquid handling tools are you using in your work? So I will read this. Uh, out aloud twice, and we would kindly ask you to answer the question. So which liquid handling tools are you using? Manual pipettes, or manual and electronic pipettes, manual pipettes and handheld dispensers, or all three, manual electronic pipettes and handheld dispensers, or if you use a pipetting robot, please click on the last um, option. Okay, so I think we have the result coming up. Okay, so thank you very much for, for answering this question. And um, this is a very interesting result, of course. Um, almost everyone is using manual pipettes, which includes the, 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 well, basically the first four answers. But it's very nice to see that 30% are already using electronic pipettes and 17.6% um, using dispensers. So, of course, today's talk will also highlight some of the benefits of these tools. So maybe in the future, um, you might consider actually even using those tools also in your work. And um, now to go further, I will hand over to Hannah E., who will guide you through the next part of the webinar. 
Thank you very much, Rudo, for this nice introduction. We will know, now go into uh, the two main pipetting systems that are available on the market nowadays. So, um, as Rudolf already said, manual pipettes with the air cushion system are the most known pipettes. So, these are many the classic pipettes. Um, therefore, one attaches a tip onto a pipette cone, as you see there. Inside the pipette is a piston that you can see here in the middle picture um, in the blue circle. This piston pushes out the air that is naturally inside the pipette cone. And when you then immerse the tip into the liquid, the liquid is aspirated into the tip due to the partial vacuum. So what you see on the far right picture, this red line indicates the air inside the pipette, and the blue drop indicates the liquid that has been aspirated. So the second system is called positive displacement system, and it's mainly used for dispenser systems. So with this system, you have a tip that has an integrated piston inside the tip, as indicated by the arrow on the far right. This piston is pulled upwards while handling the dispenser, and the liquid is soaked into the tip directly. So as you see in the picture, there is no air in between the sample and the piston. This system has distinct advantages compared to an air cushion pipette, so keep the positive displacement system in mind during the webinar. But first of all, let us have a look on pipetting techniques using the classic air cushion pipettes. Each of the following techniques can be used in certain cases, also when it comes to problematic liquids. The most common technique is called forward pipetting, and I bet all of you are doing this already. So one presses to the first stop of the operation button, then immerses the tip into the liquid and releases the button again. So the liquid is soaked into the tip. To release the liquid and to perform the blowout, it is mandatory to push the operation button down to the second stop. With this technique, it is necessary to perform the blowout, otherwise the liquid volume is not accurate. So, as you see on the picture in the far right, no liquid is left inside the tip. Now we compare it to another technique that is called reverse pipetting. This is the second technique applicable with air cushion pipettes. So you start by pushing the operation button to the second stop, then immerse the tip into the liquid and aspirate the liquid. You will now aspirate your desired liquid volume plus the blowout volume, and to release the liquid, you push the operation button to the first stop and dispense your liquid. As you see on the picture on the right, um, circled in green, there will always be a rest inside the tip that has to be discarded. This is the actual blowout volume you will not be using. This technique can be used for some problematic liquids, for example, glycerol. Air cushion pipettes in general are developed for the usage with aqueous solutions like water, common buffers like tris and saline solutions. So all air cushion pipettes are calibrated using distilled water at room temperature. So liquids with properties similar to water can be transferred accurate. But what happens if you're using a solution different than water? And this is the actual topic of the whole webinar. So, um, for example, when preparing competent cells or stock cultures, glycerol is necessary. A classic DNA extraction requires phenol and chloroform. These solutions may drip out of the pipette tip. For blobs, a tween 20 containing buffer is necessary, and the detergent may remain inside the pipette tip. In cell culture, medium is a high protein content that leads to foam formation, and the warm medium itself bears the risk of aerosol formation. A PCR setup contains multiple different solutions. So, what you realize now is that you are actually using problematic liquids every day. They all have different properties than water. Here we show some typical problems you face when handling problematic liquids, like leftovers in the tip on the upper left corner, contaminations, as in cell culture on the upper right con uh, corner. In this case, the cells are contaminated with bacteria. Then we have an inaccurate volume delivery and erratic differences in pipetting performance, which you see in the two bottom pictures, like you don't have the volume you actually set on your pipette, or if you're pipetting glycerol, even when using different techniques, you hardly get the exact 
amount of volume that you desire. So all these challenges can be overcome using the right tools and the right technique. Now I would like to have a look on the pipetting solutions for each liquid class. Today we will discuss six main classes. Number one will be volatile liquids that tend to drip out of the pipette tip. The second will be viscous liquids, which are difficult to aspirate and have a bad flow behavior. The third um, topic will be liquids which are colder than room temperature, like directly out of the fridge or the freezer. Then we will go over to liquids warmer than room temperature, like cell culture medium. Then I will lead you through liquids with a higher density than water. And uh, the last liquid will be foaming liquids that contain a lot of protein or detergents. So, but let us start with volatile liquids. And another poll question. So how do you pipette ethanol? Please choose one of the answers. Um, number one would be as fast as possible to avoid dripping. I just decanted. I used reverse pipetting. Or I pipette ethanol by mouth. So please choose your answer on how you're pipetting ethanol. We're waiting for a few seconds until everyone made a choice. And then we will discuss the results and go over to volatile liquids. So the time is over now. We will see the results soon. Great. So most of you, <clears throat> thank you for your answers. Most of you answered that you simply hurry up when transferring ethanol. Um, I, I know this answer, and I did it myself during my studies. So, but now. Let us have a look on some easier and safer options. Volatile liquids are, for example, ethanol, acetone, and chloroform. These liquids have a high vapor pressure that leads to an expansion of the air cushion and dripping out of the pipette tip in combination with an air cushion pipette. This you see in the picture where the little drop forms at the end of the tip. This automatically leads to liquid loss and possible contaminations or even a health risk when drops are spread over the workbench. So additionally, the liquid can evaporate into the pipette cone and lead to damages inside the pipette. When using an air cushion pipette with a volatile liquid, you should pre-wet the tip two to three times and perform reverse pipetting technique. Some of you already answered that you're reducing reverse pipetting in the last poll question, so this is very good, actually. So these two tips may help avoiding the dripping, but it strongly depends on the concentration of the liquid if these recommendations work properly. For example, when pipetting 70% ethanol, two times pre-wetting is sufficient to avoid the dripping. But with 96% ethanol, you would need three times pre-wetting. It is safer and more convenient to use a dispenser with the positive displacement system. Because of the absence of the air and the enclosed sample inside the tip, no drops can leak out of the tip. So what you see on the right picture is that the ethanol, in that case it's orange, is soaked into the dispenser tip and there is no air between the piston and the tip. So there is no failure and no leaking, no dripping. So before we come to the Next chapter, I would like to ask another poll question. So how do you pipette honey-like viscous liquids like glycerol? There are four choices to do. Uh, I cut the tip. I use reverse pipetting. I leave the tip inside the liquid for a long time until I think it has aspirated the correct volume. Or I use a scale to determine the amount of glycerol. So please make your decision now on how you pipette honey-like viscous liquids like glycerol. Just a few more seconds. I'm really looking forward to the answers. Here we go. Okay, so 40%. Most of you just leave the tip inside the liquid for a long time until you think it has aspirated to correct volume. Yeah, I can definitely understand that because it flows that slowly. And then um, some of you are cutting the tip, and some of you are using reverse pipetting, which is really good. 
and there's just like 13% using a scale to determine the amount of glycerol. So, for those of you who are cutting the tip, I did it myself during my studies, but, um, and I know it's frequently done, but it's actually the worst you can do because then you won't have an accurate volume delivery anymore. As soon as the tip is cut, um, you or no manufacturer could guarantee that the volume delivery is accurate. So let us see what uh, exactly happens when pipetting glycerol. As I mentioned, examples for honey-like or viscous liquids are glycerol with a concentration above 50% blood, skin cream, or mineral oil. Viscous liquids have a high inner friction between molecules in the liquid and increased pressure is necessary to transfer the liquid appropriately. These liquids show bad flow behavior and the risk of aspirating air bubbles is quite high. So accurate volume delivery is almost impossible with air cushion pipettes since you will always have leftovers in, sorry, inside the tip. What's, what you see here on the picture, there's a leftover of glycerol inside the tip. So this chart shows the comparison of an air cushion pipette using forward pipetting, that's the brown line, and reverse pipetting, which is the green line, in comparison to using a dispenser with the positive displacement system, which is the blue line. It is obvious that the desired volume of 50 microliter is not accurately achieved by air cushion pipettes no matter which technique is used. So for those of you who are using reverse pipetting, this is actually more accurate than forward pipetting, so this is pretty good. But the only system that gives reliable results is a positive displacement system. So even if you execute a low aspiration and low dispensing speed, as well as reverse pipetting when using an air cushion pipette, you will never have as accurate results as with a positive displacement system. Additionally, the piston inside the positive displacement tip of the dispenser wipes the tip clean on the inside to avoid leftovers and to guarantee a full volume delivery so you don't have any sample loss. Furthermore, you can work faster when using a positive displacement system with viscous liquids because it has a higher force. So oh, now we will jump over to the third liquid class, which are cold liquids. These are very often used in the lab. Cold means in this case that the liquid has a temperature below room temperature, and often these liquids are used directly out of the freezer, like enzymatic solutions at minus 20 degrees, um, or directly out of the fridge, like yeast medium at 4 to 8 degrees. The cold liquids lead in the first pipetting step to a shrinking of the warmer air cushion inside the pipette, and with this to a higher volume delivery than set. If you're using the same tip for multiple pipetting steps, the air cushion expands again, and then less volume is delivered than set. So after all, your pipetting result is always inaccurate with an air cushion pipette. You should always let your liquid equilibrate to room temperature before using it with an air cushion pipette. But this can be a problem, especially for enzymes, and should be avoided, as I think all of you know. They don't like to get warm. So, additionally, you can perform reverse pipetting to receive a more accurate result. But the best solution is a system with, without any air cushion, like a dispenser or like a positive displacement system. So it is independent of the temperature of the liquid and delivers the ac accurate volume because there is simply no air cushion that can shrink or expand. For the next liquid class, which are warm and or infectious liquids that have a temperature higher than room temperature, for example, cell culture medium at 37 degrees, these warm liquids have multiple risk factors. So we'll start with the first one. First of all, the warm liquid leads to a shrinking of the air cushion in the first pipetting step and leads to higher volume delivery than set again. And in all following pipetting steps with the same tip, the air cushion gets smaller again because it is still, co it's still colder than the liquid used. So the air inside the pipette is still colder than the liquid you try to transfer. Therefore, the volume delivery is higher than set. 
so your pipetting result again is inaccurate. Additionally, and that's the highest risk, you face a very high risk of evaporation of the liquid into the inside of the air cushion pipette and with this to uh, contamination via aerosols. So I would like to go more into detail on aerosols because these are a high threat nowadays. Aerosols are tiny liquid drops that evaporate basically always from the liquid into the pipette tip. And with this, directly into the pipette cone, as you see on the picture on the right. Especially warm liquids lead to very high aerosol formation. These aerosols may constantly contaminate your pipette and with this cross-contaminate all samples that you're pipetting afterwards. Additionally, you will face a false volume delivery and may risk corrosion or debris inside the pipette cone. So what can you do to avoid these aerosol formations? Some general recommendations to avoid aerosol formation even in your sample tube are mixing of the sample by rolling the tube rather than shaking. Then you should pipette directly into a liquid or onto a surface to avoid bubbling and splashing. Placing your sample tubes close to each other diminishes the way you need to pass when transferring liquids and keep in mind to slowly remove caps or stoppers to avoid a sudden opening of a tube and again splashes. So during pipetting, regarding the transfer of liquid using an air cushion pipette, you may use a filter tip to avoid splashes and retain aerosols, as well as large biomolecules like DNA and RNA. Also bacteria and viruses are held back by a filter tip. So in the picture you see a one layer filter, but the best is actually to use a two layered filter so it guarantees the highest security when using an air cushion pipette. These two layered filters have different pore sizes to avoid aerosols um, going through these filters. So as an even safer option, a positive displacement system is recommended, since here the sample is enclosed inside the tip completely. You can see on the picture that the sealing lip of the tip tightly encloses the sample and the space in between the sample and the instrument is protected against aerosols, splashes, etc., what we talked about. So no air cushion, no aerosols at all. So let us go over to the fifth liquid class, the dense liquids. Dense liquids have a higher density relative to water. Examples are sulfuric and phosphoric acid or cesium chloride solution. The heavy weight of the liquid leads to an elongation of the air cushion and with this to less volume delivered than set. So again, the volume delivery is not accurate with air cushion pipettes. This graph shows the deviation between the volume delivery of liquids with a differing density than water. For example, ethanol is not only volatile but has also a lower density than water and leads to a higher volume delivery than set when pipetting. Additionally, it drips out of the pipette tip as we discussed earlier. A high density liquid like sulfuric acid leads to less volume delivered than set, as you can see here, almost 1% less than set. So um, if you're pipetting 100 microliter and you have 1% less delivered, then you would only have 99, uh, 99 microliter and um, especially with, with acids, this can all already lead to a high deviation in your experiment um, because it's a high deviation of concentration to have lost almost one microliter. Okay. So with air cushion pipettes, you only have one option. You have to adjust the pipette to the high density liquid, which means that this pipette can only be used for the liquid adjusted to. Some um, users are also weighing the liquid. So for example, if uh, you want to pipette 50 microliter of sulfuric acid, the users are weighing out the liquid to know which volume to set on the pipette. 
If we set it extreme, if you want to pipette 50 microliter, you would have to set 60 microliter on the pipette. But this way to do it is actually not accurate. And um, user adjustment according to the user manual would be the safer option. But not all manufacturers give this opportunity. So I could just give you one, one recommendation. Well, for Eppendorf, we offer pipettes with a user adjustment. So you just look up in the user manual that you want to pipette sulfuric acid. And then you can easily turn the pipette to plus one on a little uh, window. You can see it on pictures of the pipettes. And then you can easily pipe at the dense liquid, and you can turn it back to zero and then go on with water. So this is very convenient. So, but if you don't have a pipette that is adjustable, the easiest and most convenient way to transfer high-density liquids is the usage of a dispenser with the positive displacement system. No adjustment is necessary, and one can transfer the high-density liquid accurate and precise. Another advantage is the safety of the system, especially when using aggressive acids, since the sample is securely enclosed in the dispenser tip. So this is safe for your pipette, for your workbench, and for yourself. Now let's come to another poll question. How do you deal with foaming or detergent-containing liquids? This will be the last class we will discuss. So you have four different answers. I use reverse pipetting. I use a stepper, repeater, or dispenser. I just accept the foam, or I re-aspirate the form or the bubbles from the liquid to get rid of them. So please make your decision. We will wait a few seconds. So the answer will be coming soon. Okay, here we go. Most of you are using reverse, pipet reverse pipetting. That's very, very good. Uh, some of you are also using a stepper, repeater, or dispenser, which is also great. Thank you for already using the device. Some of you just accept the foam, and some of you re-aspirate the foam in the bubbles. So um, I would like to give some recommendations for the ones who accept the foam or re-aspirate the foam, so you don't have to do this. You can... Um, have your experiments more precisely without the foam. But first of all, let's have a look on the liquid class of foaming liquids. Foaming can be a result of different liquids. For example, high protein content liquids like BSA solution or cell culture medium, and also detergent containing liquids like buffers containing tween 20 or Triton X100. Performing a blowout with air cushion pipettes with these liquids leads to bubbles and foam formation. The ascending foam can lead to contamination and cross-contamination of the pipette and other samples. So actually having the foam inside your pipette tip is a very high risk, again, also of aerosol formation. Additionally, detergents stick to the tip wall as indicated with blue dyed detergent in this picture. This leads to less volume delivery than the set volume and, again, inaccurate results. So this graph visualizes the residual moisture of detergents in a standard pipette tip after pipetting with an air cushion pipette. The violet bars show the residual moisture in a standard tip, while the pink bars show the residual moisture when using a tip developed for detergent-containing liquids called low-retention tip. The most alarming residual moisture when pipetting PCR master mix with a standard tip shows that almost 6 microliter of the master mix rests inside the pipette tip, invisible stuck to the tip wall, because, as you all know, PCR master mix is colorless. When using a low retention pipette tip, not even 1 microliter of the detergent containing PCR master mix rests inside the tip. So the yield is much higher, the volume delivery is more accurate, your results will be more reliable and you save reagents. So the first trick when using an air cushion pipette for detergent liquids is to use low retention tips, which have been specially developed for this application. A second option is to perform reverse pipetting with standard tips. 
but again, there will still be detergent stuck to the tip wall. The best option would be to use a positive displacement system. You avoid the bubbles and the foam, and additionally wipe the inside of the tip with the sealing lip to avoid residues and guarantee accurate volume delivery. So now we've been through with the liquid classes and the corresponding solutions. And I will hand over back to Rudolf, who will go through some additional benefits of dispenser systems. So thanks, Hannah. <clears throat> so as you've seen when going through the different liquid classes, we've highlighted um, dispensers as a tool or the tool of choice, which is applicable for most of the problematic liquids. And um, dispensers have additional benefits when you work with liquids, also for, for normal, um, not so demanding, simple liquids. And we briefly want to highlight those as well. So <clears throat> dispensers can help to speed up and facilitate your work. These are examples that almost every one of you may be familiar with. So one is filling plates with medium or buffer. So the dispenser allows you to briefly go from well to well and to fill all the different wells without having to aspirate the liquid multiple times. So you work much faster. And the same is true as depicted in the middle if, for example, you are doing an assay where you have short time points and you have to add reagents or um, other agents to your liquid and you have to do it in a very fast way. So also here the, the dispenser is really very beneficial for your work. Another very typical application uh, highlighted on the right side is when you are aliquoting competent bacterial cells. Of course, here you are working on ice and you have to be very fast as well to preserve the competence of the bacteria. So dispensers can help you to work in a fast uh, way. Uh, they are simple, they are stress-free, and the nice thing is that they are really a good tool for working with all sorts of different uh, liquids and liquid classes. So this is true for both manual and electronic instruments, and we have one slide on which we also want to highlight the additional benefits that come with using electronic dispensers. So on the left side, you see um, the Multipad E3X. This is a dispenser that Eppendorf offers. And there are very different programs that you can choose, and they allow you to do many other things with liquids to, to assess different liquid handling applications. And we just briefly want to highlight what those are. So you can use um, electronic dispensers for doing pH adjustment. Um, so you can very easily titrate buffers, for example. There is a new function, which is called aspirate and dispense, where you can take up an, uh, um, an unknown sample volume from, for example, different tubes, and then you can dispense it um, in different volumes that you can actually set. So this is very convenient, and you don't have to, for example, pool eluate um, in a tube before you actually go to your next dispensing step. Then, of course, you can aspirate different volumes, for example, supernatants, so you can pool samples in a very convenient way. The way the system works is also that mixing the, the different samples in the tip uh, is also very convenient by just swinging the tip. And, of course, another possibility, which is the fourth one highlighted here, is if you are doing a dilution series, um, and you are doing sequential dispensing, you can program your electronic dispenser and can very easily conduct a dilution series. You can also use the electronic dispenser like a regular pipette. So there is a pipette function. And of course, you can also do automatic dispensing where you just set the different um, volumes you want to use and you set the time intervals and you don't have to press every time you want to dispense your liquid. So these are just some examples. We want to highlight to you that using an electronic dispenser combines both the advantages of successfully handling problematic liquids with the many different applications um, that become accessible when using an electronic pipette slash dispenser. And at the same time, using it is really easy and um, it really help, it can help your work to become much faster and much easier. So towards the end, 
uh, I will hand over to Hanai again, who will very briefly summarize both the lessons learned um, today during the webinar and also present you an overview what is the recommended um, technique or tool for the different liquid classes. Okay. Thank you very much, Rudolf, for introducing the electronic dispensers. Let us sum up what we just uh, heard through this webinar. So I'd like to go through some key points we just discussed. The first one uh, we learned about is choosing the right liquid handling tool is critical and essential for optimal experimental results. Additionally, we heard that not all liquids are equal, so problematic liquids need special techniques and tools. A positive displacement system is suitable for most problematic liquids, and electronic instruments offer a wealth of additional functions and are easy to handle. So, this slide gives you an overview of the techniques to apply with problematic liquids when using air cushion pipettes. First of all, volatile liquids like ethanol should be transferred applying reverse pipetting after pre-wetting the pipette tip. Viscous liquids may be transferred applying reverse pipetting and a very low speed with an air cushion pipette. For liquids with a different density than water, your only option is to adjust the air cushion pipette. And when transferring detergent, this can be achieved by using special low retention tips and reverse pipetting with the air cushion pipettes. The last will be warm as well as infectious liquids that could lead to aerosol formation, and these may be transferred using two layered filter tips with an air cushion pipette. As you realize now that no matter which problem problematic liquid you're pipetting, the usage of the appropriate technique is essential. Furthermore, for any of the liquids we talked about, positive displacement systems are an e ideal choice. So, here we will have the last poll question for the webinar. This poll question will be left open until the complete, the total end of this webinar, so even after the Q&A session. So we would really like to know from you, how did you rate the content of this webinar? You may choose between very good, good, okay, and poor. So I would like to thank you very much for this attention, for your attention so far. Um, we would also show you, sorry, one second, where you could learn a bit more about liquid handling when you like to. So Eppendorf offers a webinar series this year covering top topics such as calibration of pipettes, pipetting in cell culture, pipette tip quality, and automated liquid handling. So you may visit our liquid handling webpage at uh, www.eppendorf.com. And if you want to learn more about the dispensers, you could go to uh, eppendorf.com slash multipad minus system. If you would like to take a look on Eppendorf's liquid handling products, you also may visit us on our booth on an exhibition, for example, the Analytica in Munich, in Germany, or in Shanghai, China, or in, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Hyderabad in India. And for participating in a pipette clinic or a full day training of pipetting techniques, you also may visit our homepage and the Eppendorf Training Center for further information or contact your local sales rep for a demo or training opportunity. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Now we wish you to successfully pipe at your problematic liquids, and we're looking forward to answer your questions. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question is, does the tip of a dispenser harm cells in cell culture? Um, yes, so, one second. So um, the question was, does the tip of a dispenser harm cells in cell culture, right? So no. Actually, so far, we don't have any evidence for a dispenser tip harming the cells. But since each cell line is different, um, I would recommend to start with the viability assay of the cells to be sure that the cell line you're using can be handled with this system. 
No. Is it possible to wash and reuse the dispenser tips? So it is not recommended to wash and reuse the tips. It might happen that small residues still stick to the inside of the tip when washing was not intense enough. And when putting the tips into a dishwasher, while the two components of a tip are separated, an accurate fitting of the piston inside the tip cannot longer be guaranteed. Um, and so I think most of you do not wash their normal pipe of tips, so you shouldn't do this with dispenser tips as well. Can I autoclave the dispenser tip? No, sorry. Since the piston and the tip are made of two different plastic types that behave different in the autoclave, they would not longer fit uh, together after autoclaving. Do I always have to dispense liquid in multiple steps when using a dispenser? <clears throat> um, actually, when you're working with a manual dispenser, you do not have the option to choose another dispensing technique. You always have to dispense in multiple steps. But when you're using an electronic dispenser, you might also have the option to use it like a pipette. For example, with the new um, multi-pad repeater E3X, you have a pipette mode, and there you can just um, aspirate and dispense the same volume. What if I only want a pipette only two microliters of a precious viscous liquid? OK, so um, pipetting means that you would only aspirate two microliter and want to dispense it again. So therefore, also positive displacement pipettes exist. So these are actually no dispensers. These are really positive displacement pipettes. They work according to the same principle like a dispenser. Their uh, tips have a piston inside and enclose the sample completely. But these positive displacement tips cannot be used for dispensing, only for pipetting. And they go down to very small vol volumes, for example, 1 to 20 microliter, which would be the uh, Biomaster. What's a variable volume pipette turn into a fixed volume pipette after adjustment? This is actually a very complicated question. Um, to get the accurate volume delivery of your high-density liquid, you might need a smaller air cushion inside the pipette, so that one microliter needs to be aspirated additionally, for example. When you set the volume of your pipette to 100 microliter and then adjust it to aspirate additionally one microliter, you must add this one microliter to all other volumes too. So for water, you would then aspirate 101 microliter, which is not accurate. Um, but with the higher density liquid, you will aspirate 100 microliters, since the air cushion is adjusted to this density. So basically, an adjusted pipette can only be used for the one liquid you adjusted it to, and only with the volume set that you used for adjustment. So you could just if you have a 100 to 1,000 microliter pipette, you adjust it at 100 microliter to a dense liquid. You can really just use it as a 100 microliter pipette for this dense liquid. So it doesn't um, make that much of a sense. So I would always recommend to use a positive displacement system for that. Can you explain pre-wetting the pipette tip? What does that mean? Okay, yeah, I've said this word quite a few times. Um, so this means that you actually aspirate the liquid you want to transfer once into the tip and release it directly back into the same vessel. So that the inside of the tip is once in contact with the liquid. This leads to a saturation of the air cushion inside the piper tip, and this raises the accuracy of your pipetting volume. So in the next step, you would then aspirate the volume desired again and transfer it to your target vessel. It's like an additional pipetting step. Okay, next person, thank you for your informative webinar. Uh, when mm -hmm. pipetting viscous liquid using air cushion pipettes, does it help if a higher volume pipette is used? For instance, uh, I pipette one milliliter of tween. I think that's 2.0 using a five milliliter pipette. Okay, that's an interesting question. Thank you very much. Actually, this even higher is the inaccuracy of the pipette. Because the bigger the air cushion is, the worse is the inaccuracy. 
So if you have to use an air cushion pipette for transferring glycerol, you should use the pipette according to the volume you want to transfer. So in this special case, if you want to pipette one milliliter of twin 20, then please use a one milliliter pipette if you don't have any other option and apply reverse pipetting. Do you have repeater E3X with multiple channels? Actually, we do not have the repeater E3X with multiple channels. Um, but when using a dispenser, you can fill all these wells in, so ma in, uh, in multiple steps that actually a multi-channel version is uh, not necessary. Because you can fill the tip and dispense in 96 steps, so you can easily fill a whole plate. And we did some comparisons here with our colleagues that using the repeater E3X compared to a multi-channel manual pipette is much faster. Well, thank you. I would like to once again thank Dr. Hanne Henke and Dr. Rudolf Volchek for their presentations. Do you have any final comments? Oh, we just thank you very much for all your attention and your very nice uh, moderator, Judy. Yeah, thanks a lot also from my side. Um, it was very nice. And um, if you have any, this goes to the customers, if you have any additional um, questions about liquid handling, um, please um, approach Eppendorf and uh, we are always prepared to help you with your liquid handling work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you once again and have a nice day or a good night uh, depending on where you are in the world. <laughs> Thanks again for your presentations, and I would also like to thank our sponsor, Eppendorf, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye. Bye.